What's up guys? Today I'm bringing you back another Q&A. If you have any questions, post yours down below and let's begin. First question, what would you suggest to deal with armpit pain like the one discussed in your wide grip pull-up video during any overhead exercise? I can't do vertical push or pull movements. I would eventually like to get back on doing them. Thank you so much for your amazing videos. My first piece of advice is to be careful with long head of the triceps exercises. Why? Because this armpit pain you're describing might not just be the teres lat area could also very well be your triceps in that lengthened position. And so I would caution against doing overhead barbell, dumbbell, or cable extensions, or in general, emphasizing the lengthened position. You wanna primarily stick to the shorn position variation. So your dual row pushdowns should be prioritized over overhead extensions. Also, if you are gonna get that stretch shot position, it shouldn't be to the extreme. So I'd recommend a decline or flat extension rather than maximally being stretched over here, similar to that overhead position that's causing you pain. So the first thing is to recognize that everything is interconnected. And the fact that you told me it's not just the vertical poles, which was what my video was about. You told me vertical presses bother you, and then I know for a fact that these overhead extensions is also gonna contribute more to this current pain. So swap those out for less intense variations. For example, with my chest expander, you see me do the sideways extension and the violin extension. I found that when I'm going through this overuse, I can't do the violin extension. It can only be the sideways version, which still hits the long head, but not to the same extent in the stretch position. So minimize that. And then regarding your back training, best advice I can give you is to just train the horizontal movement patterns for one, but secondly, use a neutral grip. I specifically like the medium grip or really close. So your hands can literally be like this, similar to the V-bar that you use in the cable station. Same thing with weighted pull-ups. Stop with the wide grip for now. I'm even gonna extend that to lap pull-downs. Don't use the traditional wide grip bar where you're grabbing the collars doing this. You're gonna aggravate the same area. Doesn't matter if it's a pull-up or lap pull-down, okay? You wanna minimize pronation and going too wide, which is what causes overuse to begin with. So anything that's neutral or on the narrower side or it allows for natural rotation, which is easier on the joints, will serve you. You do that for a couple months, then you can start reintroducing the wide grip pull-ups. And when you do them, control your reps. Stop jerking, maybe stop going weighted as well. This is certainly what I had to do. And my favorite hack to date is using the fat grips because they force me to stay in check. I can't be kipping all over the place using trash foam. Everything's gotta be controlled and smooth and it caps my reps to around the 10 to 15 zone. I'm not gonna get 20 plus reps doing fat grip wide pull-ups. Same thing for you. Make the exercise harder rather than you trying to overload, which is not typically advised for this variation. All right, so to simplify all this, be careful when stretching your long head. This includes pullovers. For back, primarily do horizontal pulls, but when you incorporate the vertical, make sure it's the variations I described. Then you told me you can't do vertical presses. Do something that is less vertical. So when you're doing your OHP, instead of being 100% upright, do it on a bench, we had a slight angle, or just do 60 degree inclines for the time being. Your anterior delts are not gonna somehow shrink. So start lower and work your way back up and certainly avoid behind the neck pressing because that tends to stretch out those triceps a little bit more as well. How have you some movements in for months on end without plateauing? I know in the past you preached three weeks is a good time to rotate, yet lately you've been able to milk movements for much longer. Example, decline bench, anterior dog press, etc. Any info is always appreciated, my man, of course. And I always enjoy your questions because it's thought provoking. Now, why have I been keeping in some of these movements in for much longer. There's a couple reasons. First, let me state that with the max effort method, you'll never see me do the same exercise a week in a row. It's not possible. I've yet to do this a single time in making YouTube videos. And I've been running this kind of programming since the summer of 2014. So when it comes to top singles, there are no exceptions for the most part. And even novice lifters, I like to see my new changes going from wide grip to close grip, etc. right? That said, for the back down work, or just escaping the idea of strength training, when it comes to double progression, you can milk a movement in for much longer than three weeks. We're not talking about three week waves by which I'm adding a set at a time or upping the percentage by two to three percentage points or the RPE. I'm not doing ascending RPE like seven, eight, nine and then rotating it through. No, if I'm sticking to the six to 10 rep range or eight to 12 or whatever the f 
and I'm using double progression or dynamic double progression, that can obviously be milked for much longer periods of time. Of course, there will still be an exercise rotation element, but not after three weeks. It might be six weeks or longer. And in the case of declines, inclines, and the seat anterior delt press, what you have to understand is that I'm very new to these movements. As crazy as that may sound, I've been training for well over 10 years now. I never did these movements. I've been a standing overhead press guy. Never did inclines except for a very shallow angle on my uh, flat bench. You know, I used to prop it up on a plyometric box. Declines, this is the first time ever where I'm really going hard on them and I'm really enjoying it. I also use it for isolation work, which I'm really fine to be a game changer, but more on that in future videos. Point is, what have I always told you guys? When you're new to an exercise, you can milk it for longer because you haven't really mastered the movement patterns yet and there's still a lot more adaptations to be made without overcomplicating things. So when I see novices saying, hey, should I use a high exercise selection when it comes to the progression? I'm always like, no, because you don't have to. Milk whatever the fuck you got right now. Make those gains, bro. And it extends to me as well. Whatever you're new to, don't just relate it back to your big three standards. Yeah, you can be elite at the flat bench, but not the incline. So if you know that, the programming can adjust accordingly. Now, there will come a point where, yeah, these exercises I just mentioned are all going to be super balanced and progress will slow down exponentially. What am I then going to include? More frequent exercise rotation. But if it ain't broke, why would I attempt to fix it? Also, another key component is the frequency aspect. I don't overhead press twice a week anymore. So even though I can keep in the anterior delt press for a long period of time, when you math out how many workouts I performed it, it's not that much different than when I was rotating a lot more. It just might appear that way if we're looking at the long-term time frame of using it for months. But on a workout per workout basis, the actual addition of the sets, it's about what I mentioned before. Six to eight weeks, maybe three months tops. Like right now, I'm primarily using the dumbbell version. I feel like I milked the bar for quite some time. Inclines, I'm doing a lot more 45 degree angles. I started experimenting with dumbbells and the camber bar. So there comes a point where you got to switch things up. But at the time, I didn't need it, you know? So what I would tell you is don't look at my programming and try to apply it to yourself when we have to calibrate according to experience level. And when I give you guidelines, that is all they are. At the end of the day, we got to learn to program for ourselves. Nothing is so black and white that it's, you got to rotate every three weeks. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. Even when you're really freaking strong. Hi, Alex. Does unilateral dumbbell work like switching from double to single hand bicep curl, double to single hand rear delt flies overcome the biological law of accommodation? As you said, if for dumbbell pressing and dumbbell OHP done unilaterally. No, it doesn't because the movement pattern is so similar that it's not really going to make a massive difference. Perhaps you're going to gain or lose a rep or two, maybe three at the absolute max. But if I'm doing a one arm dumbbell press, and the other arm is supported on a rack or anything stationary, right? Is my pec getting a different stimulus than having two arms at the same time? No, the strength curves are practically identical. I'll be able to lift the same weights and it's not offering anything special other than possibly wasting your time. So I would only recommend those one arm variations when you are limited by weight. In a sense, you don't have an equal amount of plates for both adjustable dumbbells or you've been injured or have such a psychotic muscular imbalance that you quite literally have to train that single side exclusively. But would I recommend that in 2022? Not so much. I used to do a lot of that stuff, standing one arm overhead presses. You see me do hundred pounds and 90 pounds for reps, but that doesn't offer any unique benefits over doing it both arms at the same time or sitting down. I suppose the advantage when you're standing is your core is going to be less of a limiting factor because if I got a hundred and a hundred, yeah, stability might be potentially problematic. But in terms of muscle building stimulus, it's not going to override jack. Shit. It's not the same as going from barbell to dumbbell. And regarding the shoulders, a rear delt fly, you're basically wasting your time doing it one arm at a time. 
Though when we talk about side raises, that might not be the case because now you can lean this way while grabbing onto a rack and the strength curve is actually different. So it could have advantages in that context, but only because it's changing the strength curve. If it's not, if it basically looks the same, like if I do a one arm curl like this versus two arms at the same time, you're not overriding the law of accommodation. So that's what you gotta factor in. How close is it to the initial exercise? Hey Alex, what would you recommend for leg training to someone dealing with hip impingement I've had really bad hip pain for the last two months while squatting parallel or further. I can still do deadlifts, but I like squatting. I would like to do some other compound for legs other than deadlifts. Should I do partial ROM squats or just avoid squatting completely? I would not recommend partial range squats unless it's done off a box and it has to be extremely minor. So you're at parallel, slightly above, like maybe an inch more tops. So if you're normally squatting off a 12 inch box, do it off a 13 but not a 15, because then you're just ego lifting. You're wasting your time. You have to load up all kinds of plates. The carryover is gonna be garbage to lower positions. And you're actually not gonna correct this imbalance that you're dealing with because the primary issue is your adductors are weak. See, when I got shredded last year, I started having hip pain for the first time in my life and I couldn't figure it out. I was like, what is going on? To the point where I was even contemplating not doing the squats anymore, making a video, making excuses. But I knew that wasn't the right approach because when I looked at my physique visually, I could see that my adductors shrank. I had a little bit more of a thigh gap going on, less rubbing action. And considering the fact that the squat will greatly work your adductors and glutes, obviously the glutes is not what's gonna result in hip pain, so I knew it was the adductor. So what did I do? First of all, thoroughly warm up on your squats if you're dealing with hip pain. In this situation, you can't afford to make rapid jumps. That's more reserved for when you're pain-free. Like these days, it's really fast when I squat. I do one plate, two plate, three, straight into four, no problem, right? But when I was dealing with this hip pain, I would often do two sets of 10 with the empty bar, then about two sets with 135, then 185, then two plates, then two and a half. I would work in all those quarter numbers. Even though I don't recommend training that way, a thorough warm-up is advised for squatting when you have pain, right? And then, you want to use a squatting style that's actually going to work your adductors a bit more. So something that's on the wider side. So I started doing that on my belt squats. Also, on the regular version, I would consciously try to shove those knees out instead of letting that knee cave in. And what I noticed that over time, my adductors grew, hip pain went away. It's probably the same thing for you. And I think if you do it off the box, it's going to be even easier to make progress because you're getting that deloading effect where there's some of that reversal discomfort you know so modify the way you squat ever so slightly and then you'll want to work your adductors directly a lot of dudes are reluctant in doing so they don't want to use the good girl bad girl machine but i'm telling you it's money i've been using that since 2016 whenever i'm a public gym you best believe i'm on that machine opening and closing those legs are you trying to get gains or not and what's really cool is bald omni man has also been talking about this recently how for his home gym, he would literally buy it. Again, you're not doing this for glutes, you're doing it for the adductors. And for that, it works great. So in my experience, that's usually what caused the hip pain from squats. I don't think it's smart to drop them out completely. What are your thoughts about shoulders up, back and down? I remember you recommending it in one of your old benching videos, but I recently saw you like Ben Yane's post about its wrongness. I don't hold maximum attraction anymore. That doesn't mean I don't retract at all. On some exercises, I will. But I will always include a protraction element. So I'm not locked in completely. I will allow my shoulders to retract, protract. Or I'll just keep in some depression. Or I won't do anything at times if I want to use that as a variation. So on my Larson presses, I do it 100% flat back plus with an arch. On the incline bench, I don't arch unless it's a really high angle and I'm trying to intentionally lower it. But for the most part, flat. Overhead press, no retraction, man. I let my scaps move. With weighted calisthenics, certainly no retraction. I want to protract when I'm doing my push-ups, dips, etc. Handstand push-ups, no retraction. When I do rows, I don't retract first and then pull. I do it in one smooth motion. It's called the scapulohumeral rhythm. A lot of us 
have been duped into thinking we have to maintain this throughout the entirety of our set, but we don't have to. So there's different ways you can look at it, but I think the idea that you always have to hold it 100% of the time, never allowing for freedom, is probably wrong. But does that then mean we should never retract or depress? I am not totally convinced that's the case, you know, and I'm yet to see any long-term evidence proving that this is true. But I 100% agree that the scapular humor rhythm is a real thing. And more often than not, we don't have to do anything. Just let your body naturally move. And in my case, I select. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It all depends on the exercise. But in 2022, I would say that if you never even think about retraction moving forward, you just adopt good, controlled, solid technique, you'll probably not have pain. And I honestly believe that in my case, I can get away with 100% flat back for basically everything. It's a choice when I choose to retract, not a necessity. So doing OHP seated from low pin position, pin heights perfectly for full ROM, do you recommend this variation every rep full dead stop? It's a good variation and Steve Shaw has been talking about it recently, wish he did it years back. I think it's good for strength athletes who want to develop more bottom strength. And what's good about doing it this way is it's slightly more specific to the standing press, but you're still sitting down. So you're getting that dead stop component. Now, could you also do a pause rope at the bottom? 100% yes. But there's something magical about breaking up the eccentric concentric chain, which applies to OHP and bench press. So as a max effort variation, I think this is very good for low reps. Same thing. Would I do high reps on this? Not really. It's probably going to beat up your joints. In general, I learned the hard way that pin pressing is best reserved for higher intensity. So that's what I would use it for. So yeah, it is good. But for hypertrophy, I don't think this offers any significant advantages. Like the seated anterior delt press is stable enough. What should the ratio between vertical and horizontal pulls be? I tend to do two vertical variations and three horizontal variations. My main goal right now is to look thicker from the side, which is why I'm focusing more on horizontal variations. For what? Presses or pulls or both? Regardless, five compound movements in a workout is too much. If you're resting three minutes between sets, the max I would do is four. So two vertical, two horizontal. And that solves the problem right then and there. It's just 50-50. But... If I were to talk about emphasizing one, if we bring it to the poles, right? It all depends if your upper back or lats are lagging. You know, are you lacking width or thickness? If it's width, then you wanna maybe favor the vertical. So three vertical, one horizontal. If it's the opposite, you flip it. Now, the other argument is it doesn't matter because what you have to look at is the muscle biasing effect. If I do a seal row with a trap bar or chest supported row where my arms are tucked in like this, that's going to bias more lats compared to upper back, even though I'm doing a horizontal pull and a true one at that. Likewise, if I do a wide grip weighted pull up or lat pull down, which so many guys are doing and labeling it as lats, sure, I'm going to get some thoracic lats in there, but the main developer will be rhomboids, traps, teres major. So it's not about vertical versus horizontal. It's about the muscle biasing effect and how that plays a role in your current physique. Now, in your case, you did mention want to look thicker from the side. So upper back is going to be the priority. Whether it's vertical or horizontal, doesn't matter. Just make sure you're selecting the right exercises. It also doesn't mean that you neglect your lats, by the way. Keep in mind when you do the wider pull-ups, you're still going to hit the thoracic lats. So I'll consider that thickness builder, but don't think you now need an additional lat movement because it wasn't hit. No, it still got hit, is what I'm saying. And then for the presses, most people are better off not overdoing the vertical because the anterior delts get worked in basically everything we do. But if you're in a specialization phase, yeah, you can do two variations for that. If we're talking about an upper body workout where you're doing four freaking exercises, right? But I would say you're better off just emphasizing the flat decline incline angle as opposed to doing more verticals. Hey Alex, do you go full stretch on incline chest press? Always. Every chest compound movement that I do, 100% of the time, I will touch my chest or even go beyond in some cases, like using the camber bar or doing deficit push-ups and weighted dips. Why would I skip out on the most hypertrophic part of the exercise? You want to maximally stretch your pecs to the point where you can even do partials in that position, all things being equal. If you just did bottom-up reps, you skip the lockout. That would grow you more than doing half reps and locking out. 
In fact, a lot of you guys are seriously ego lifting on incline presses, not just with the barbell, but also dumbbell, which is why so many lifters seem to only grow their shoulders and triceps from compound movements. Now, for those who say, oh, it's my active range of motion. The reason you claim that is because you're maximally flaring your elbows out to the side and using a really wide grip. In that case, I'm 100% on board with you. Even I wouldn't be able to touch my chest. It would feel like absolute garbage, not just on my shoulder joints, but in general. So what you have to do is narrow out that grip and tuck in those elbows. Simplest solution in the world. And in extreme cases, just retract your scapula. Remember that previous question I had? It's not black and white. Sometimes it'll allow you to get a little bit deeper. You know, it depends on the angle of that incline. Maybe you just didn't set it correctly. So for 99% of you, yeah, you probably should go all the way down. You probably don't have some freak build where it's impossible to touch your chest. For the most part, those who struggle with that are really large men who are probably on steroids as well. They're so muscle bound that they're tight as they have mobility that is not applicable to most. So I would even extend this to the overhead press. You got guys saying that they can't touch their chest, that their active range of motion is at the forehead level. I call bullshit. There's no way that this is your active range of motion. That is a complete lie. You're just fooling yourself. Stop listening to all these TikTokers who say, yeah, I'm doing my active range of motion. No, you're quarter repping, mother. That is not an overhead press. It's the same thing with the incline. You're barely going down. You're doing these little half reps. You're wasting your time. Good luck growing your upper chest doing that. Maybe this is why guys complain that the basics didn't work because they're not even doing them correctly. What do you say about training for the one arm chin up in my intensity days? That's a very smart idea because the percentage of your one arm max is what matters. And the one arm chin up is usually super maximal for most people. So if you open up your workout with that, you can barely get your chin over the bar. Maybe just one single for the day. You're good. That's your max effort. Now you can back it down, do some regular weighted chin-ups. You don't even have to do singles and triples. You can stick to the 510 rep range on those regular chins. So I think it's very good for guys who have the strength and who specifically want to improve upon it. You're getting more specific, but you're also getting the maximum straining effect because you're using the max effort method. That's what this is, right? So it's a brilliant way to open up your workout. Now, let's say you're doing the assisted version and you can only get like five reps per arm, that can be used for secondary work. So maybe you started off with a max effort chin up, then you did some back downs on it, and then your final movement is gonna be assisted one arm chins. Man, you're gonna get huge lats doing that. Man, I would reckon your arms will improve as well. Of course, hit your curls right after. Do those ring curls or barbell, dumbbell, cable curls, etc., to ensure complete development, but still, this is a great combo. How do I get into low bar? I can't for some reason, but I want to for good mornings. Please watch a low bar squat tutorial because there's too much for me to cover in a simple Q&A, but the biggest mistake I see is guys setting the J-cups way too high, the same as their high bar positioning. A good way to look at this is by positioning them to where the bar is gonna end up on your back. In the case of low bar, you don't wanna be up here. Get it down low. This way, the moment you get tight, you're already in that forward lean position. It's perfectly set from the get-go. And what you now do is leg press that weight up. But your leverages are optimized from the start. That's how it's done. You don't start upright and then you bend forward. You're wasting energy. It's gonna be difficult getting into starting position. So lower it, man. Around two to three stops, should be more than enough. The lower, the better. I'd rather you have it too low than too high, which might seem weird at first. You're gonna be looking at it like, yo, isn't this designed for a shorter person? But no, for low bar, that is what you want. All right, final question. Do you think the Bells of Steel Light commercial is worth getting over the new Hydra series rack? Yes, because all the racks that Bells of Steel offers are affordable and high quality. But if I can go back in time, completely redo my home gym, I would 100% go with the new three by three Hydra series because it's on a whole new level. The heavy duty nature and customization. There's so much you can do. You can basically get your dream power rack right now. You can add so many different attachments. You can choose if you want it to be shorter or taller, the width, if you want it to be on the floor or wall mounted. 
It's honestly insane. If you go on the Hydrorack page, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's even compatible with other brands. So if you want to get your main rack from Bells of Steel, get your additional stuff from, say, Rogue, you can do that. Everything works. It's like they say, bomb proof. Because it's going to last you a lifetime. Literally. And you'll be able to handle a lot more abuse. So what I would say is, if you're a really serious lifter, like myself, consider it. But if you just want a casual home gym, yeah, you can downgrade to their original racks. They're still very, very good. Certainly better than this rack right here. Like I'm even considering selling this one to change. And hey, if you're interested, maybe hit me up. But seriously, the first time I saw that 3x3 trailer, my jaw dropped. I really want it. And moving forward, it would be my only choice. So yeah, guys, check it out for yourself and you'll be shocked of the overall value. With that said, we're done this Q&A. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's see some more questions down below. I'll talk to you all next time.